move like Roman soldiers into the wilds of the psyche to fix under a canceling star Hermes and Aphrodite sipping on the sunlit juice. So I'm here with Nick Russell, who um, probably has done more in his life than we can even include in an interview, let alone a preamble. Um, but we're going to talk about two things. Um, one, his old, his new book, um, the second volume of James Hellman, the Jungian Analyst's autobiography, and then also some stuff about shamanism, schizophrenia, um, you know, the deep unconscious and Dick's relationship with his son and the book that he wrote about that. And we may get to some other stuff, too, but uh, those are probably pretty big topics. Um, so thank you so much for being here. It's really exciting to talk to you. Hey, Joel, really glad to be with you today and meet you in person. Yeah, I um, I guess first off, some people have probably are familiar with uh, James Hellman, but we should give a little bit of a preamble about him. Um, you know, he was a Jungian analyst that was very influential, uh, especially in bringing Jungian ideas to America. Um, and it wasn't that the Jungian ideas were not in America. It was that uh, they were brought by kind of the New Age movement and com- the completely sapped of any meaning or a real connection to Jung. And I think Hillman brought um, a-, a lot of like depth psychology ideas to the U.S. in a way that uh, was pretty pure and interesting. And got he was a lot of people's first experience um, with Jung. Kind of a rebel, you know. I think he probably didn't catch on as much in Europe because they're a little bit more uptight. Especially Britain, British analysts were kind of always suspicious of him. And volume one of his autobiography came out a while ago. And I didn't realize until I was buying volume two last night that there's a volume three, too. So this isn't even really going to be the end of it. I know. Yeah, it's it's a it's a tome. Um, but, you know, I think he's worth it. I mean, he's he's been called um, he was called this in a profile of him by the a Connecticut newspaper a few years back. The wisest man you've probably never heard of. Oh, and, yeah, I, I saw that article. It's still online. Yeah, yeah, it's a great article, and uh, you know, I, I I didn't ever intend to be his biographer. I'm, I'm not a psychologist per se. You know, I've, I've I've read a lot of Jung when I was younger, and 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 since, and uh, my it's my or extended my extended family had discovered Hillman's work in the 1990s, and we were reading him then at that time. He had just published The Soul's Code. Uh, that was his big claim to fame. He, he was, was he was kind of regretting his career and bemoaning, you know, maybe burning some of the bridges he burned and saying that he didn't have a superannuation, you know, right when uh, Soul's Code got him on the Oprah Winfrey show. <laughs> and, uh, that's, that's right. Yeah, Oprah loved that book, and of course, once you're on Oprah, it, it became the number one best-selling book in the country. Yeah, she could time. she could have had like the the 1992 CRX Honda motorcycle guide to maintenance on her show, and it would have sold <laughs> a million copies. Exactly. So. So yeah, that that book made him pretty well known, and and it was a it was only the second book he kind of well not that his other books weren't quote popular, but uh, he he nominated for a Pulitzer Prize for revisioning psychology back in the 1970s when he wrote that. Yeah. But the Souls Code was very accessible, and and you know it's I write about it in volume three actually, which is coming out um, in a couple of months. There all the all three volumes are done. And again, people might ask, "What? This is a three-volume biography of this uh, depth psychologist. What's that all about?" And uh, I can understand that. But uh, not only do I like to write these kind of in-depth uh, tomes, I've written uh, fifteen books all together, and some of them are pretty damn long, <laughs> for better or for worse, right? But mm-hmm. uh, but you know, I I feel like he is one of the greatest thinkers that we've ever had. Um, Thomas More the theologian and, and also best-selling author said that, and he knew Hillman very well. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's kind of hard to know where to start. I, I, I think I should probably start with how I came to write this book. Don't you? I mean, it was a very unusual thing for me to take on. Did he know that you were going to write his autobiography? Did he give you his blessing or permission or did family do that? Well, he did once, but, but not in it. Well, here, here's the story initially. We, we got to know each other. And it's not an autobiography, by the way. It's a biography. I mean, I interviewed, you know, dozens of people about him. And, and he fully... Did I call it an autobiography? I'm sorry, I misspoke. That's okay. You know, I mean, they're close. But, uh, and, and there's a lot of his writings in the book, which, and letters and all of that, which make it almost autobiographical. But, um, no, I had gotten to know him initially in kind of a, a strange way. Uh, we were reading him, as I say, and... One day in the kitchen of my house when I was living in Boston, then a young man had grown up in our extended family, 
uh, he said, we were talking about Hillman, and he said, oh, my dad knows James Hillman. He sells him his organic vegetables in the market in Connecticut. I said, oh, wow, Henry, really? I, that, that's, uh, you think I, I'd be able to meet him sometime? I'm so interested in his ideas. And, and uh, he said, well, uh, so he gave, I called his father, who was an organic farmer in Connecticut, an old friend of mine. And uh, he said, well, you know, he, James Hillman's a very private person, you know, so I don't know. But he arranged the lunch anyway. And my wife and I went there and met with him and with my friend Wayne Hansen, who was the introductory introduction for us. And it kind of began, a, there was a friendship that began that day. He was 21 years older than I, so we weren't contemporaries, really. But we both had common interests, including not in psychology, but we talked about how we both spent time, a lot of time in Africa when we were young, just traveling around, right? And then he was a big fan of boxing, interestingly, which... I had gotten to know Muhammad Ali uh, at one point in my life. And so we kind of just connected on these, these, these other levels. And then he visited us in our homes. Um, uh, we, we had homes in a couple of different parts of the country, the group of people that I've been living with for a long time. And uh, he loved the way we lived. Uh, and just as a, he you had a communal living situation for a while, didn't you? Or am I making yeah. that up? No, you're not making it up. I still, I still do live that way. Cool. And he was, he was very interested in that. Uh, because we've been living together for so long, and 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 we, uh, you know, we had these lovely houses we created in a very very successful construction company. But it was more the feeling of community that he always uh, admired and longed for, and it was part of in his own life. Uh, collaborations were really hugely important to him, and mm-hmm. so he and his wife Margot visited us a number of times, and then that went on for a few years, and then. Um, in two, the end of 2004, I think it was, um, his older sister was visiting in Connecticut. And we went up there. I went up there for a visit over the Christmas holidays. And she was telling all these stories about how he the growing up years in Atlantic City, right? And and uh, the boardwalk when it was the heyday of it, of all of that in the 1920s. And There was something about Hillman that never got away from the boardwalk. I mean, he, he still was kind of a carnival barker in the way that he brought <laughs> his personality to the world you know it, it he, he you know he was a brilliant brilliant guy you know yeah but there still was a little bit of kind of almost a grifter type you know soap with a prize in it language that he he, he probably liked you know was <laughs> well, he did you know and he, he grew up in this amazing fantasy world of mm. you know uh of all these performers the uh, trapeze artists and so on that, that performed on the boardwalk and and his family owned a, a hotel there uh, called the Breakers, and then uh, and that's where he was born. He was born in a hotel room in 1926, yep. actually. And um, it was a Jewish family. Yes, and they and they his, his grand his one grandfather on his on the other side of his family was a very famous rabbi, Joseph Krauskopf, and a reform rabbi. Interestingly, uh, not conventional at all. Just like James Hillman was not conventional, and uh, you know, and he he told me this was all in volume one, but he he talked to me about how he. He used to go down into the basement, right? And he loved hanging out with the, the workers in the hotel, observing how they did things. And and so he grew up in this fascinating uh, milieu and got to know all kinds of interesting people that his parents you, had. All you, you have these beautiful descriptions in the vo- in the first volume that are almost would be better served in a novel about, you know, the, the um, African-American servants are, or the African-American workers are lining their pockets with wax paper so that they can scrape the extra food off the table to take <laughs> home to their families. And that, you know, James Hillman contemplating the deep unconscious is probably sitting on the boardwalk walk, watching these nets of, of wriggling beasts being writhed out of the depths. And he starts wondering what's inside of himself. Exactly. And it's just a beautiful, almost Lovecraftian way to, to, to build setting um, in a biography, yeah. which is not what you expect with, out of a biography. Oh, thank you. Yeah, the deep sea net holes, they called them, right? And uh, at any rate, his sister was talking when she was there in 2004 about those years and growing up in that family. And they, he had three siblings. And and uh, I told him afterwards, I said, you know, God, she's older than he. And I said, you should really capture these uh, on tape while she's still alive because uh, they're great stories. And so this gave him the idea to bring his, his siblings and as many of his kids as could come together that summer. And a young filmmaker that was also grown up in my family, my extended family, came in and filmed the weekend. An old friend of his, Kenny Donahue, came from Ireland. And 
it was a marvelous uh, weekend. Lots of great food and everything in Connecticut, and that uh, and 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 in the course of that, I was I'm an investigative reporter, right? So I started asking a lot of questions, and and afterwards, our wives, uh, Margot and Alice, got together and were having a glass of wine, and I think Alice asked, uh, "Was James ever going to do a biography?" And and Margo said, um, you know, he's never wanted to do that. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> he said, if anybody is going to do it, I'd, he'd like me to do it. Partly because I didn't have, I think, because I didn't have an axe to grind. I wasn't a psychologist yeah. with, you know, all these uh, ideas of, and concepts about the field. And, and, and there's not I, very many people that could write about Hillman in an unbiased way, you know. Yeah, I think so. And and because uh, he's really... He's out there, you know. He's a very controversial right. character, and uh, even in the Jungian world. And so, I just dove into it and and started going out there and interviewing people. And we, Alice and I, went to uh, to Ireland, uh, where he'd gone to school at Trinity College in Dublin. Uh, and and then we went there with uh, he and his wife. And then I went to Zurich and interviewed people at the Jung Institute, where he'd started out, and where he met Jung in the nineteen mm-hmm. fifties, and had known him uh, pretty well. And Jung had then appointed him to be the first director of studies of the Jung Institute, a very prestigious position. Yeah, that was one of the questions that I had. I think your line, if I'm remembering in that book, I read that when my daughter was born, so that was six years ago now, but you said that Jung, when Jung died, there was a huge vacuum of a father wound or something, that he was a man that kept his opinions close and that did not give out approval very freely, that there was kind of a power vacuum. Yeah, And it's it always, I mean, I kind of read between the lines of a lot of things I knew about the Institute early on that, you know, C.A. Meyer had had kind of a falling out with Jung uh, disagreement. And when Hellman is appointed to be the provisional director as this upstart, I mean, I don't think Meyer ever really forgave him for that. Yeah, I don't think so either. I mean, I never knew Meyer or interviewed him, but because he was dead by the time I was doing the book. But uh I got the feeling he wasn't a really a nice guy. He was a very well known. Uh, he was Jung's, uh, you know, aide de camp for a while, or at least you know, a fellow uh, analyst that worked with him. But he's there, he got, and yeah, uh, he, and it, he was. And then it got really. Uh, I get into this in volume one. It got to, to be a sticky situation because yeah, uh, Hillman was eventually fired uh, as director of studies by the Jung Institute for having had an affair with a one of his patients in Annalis Nand. And at the same time, Meyer, who was pushing for Hillman's dismissal, turned out was having an affair with Hillman's wife, Kate. But then he called the man that Hillman had an affair with the wife of and said, hey, listen, Hillman did this. And if you want to sue him, I'll pay for the lawyer. I mean, yeah. That's, that's I mean, it's pretty, pretty wild. wild right? uh, it's pretty, <laughs> pretty hypocritical, too, I just I would say. But anyway, that's and the, then when Hellman confronted him about having an affair with his wife, he said, "Oh, that's between you and your wife, or something." <laughs> like, something like that. Just missed it completely. So yeah. Anyway, but it was well, it was an interesting thing that happened because it moved Hillman into a whole new realm that he then uh, fathered along with uh, Rafael Lopez Pedraza and and Pat Barry, who was a student of his, not the one he had the affair with in the, the first time he got dismissed, but um, he also had a relationship with Pat eventually, and they got married, and uh, and they they worked together uh, with uh, Raphael to create what's called archetypal psychology, mm-hmm. which was very different than the analytical psychology that Jung had, had created. Um, different in the sense that it was polytheistic, you know. It, it it harkened back to the to the gods of of, of uh, Greece, and then uh, the, the Renaissance scholars. Um, and it, Hellman was obsessed with polytheism and really did not like Judaism or Christianity. I mean, I I think when I had talked to David Tacy about his analysis with Hellman, he said at one point Hellman said, "Quit having dreams about Christianity. Start dreaming about Greece." <laughs> was like, I can believe it. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, it was all about um, bringing and introducing a new element, which were the archetypes, you know, and which were myths and imagination and mm-hmm. getting people away from not that it was wrong, but the personalized psychology, the emphasis on the self and, uh, mm-hmm. and young psychology 
which was analytical. You know, it was called analytical psychology. And, yeah. and Hillman's was was very different than that. And he was he was hearkening back to an earlier time to connect people. He called it as Keats the poet had. He called it soul making. Mm -hmm. You know, and how do you how how do you reach the essence of yourself in order to become more of who you are? Well, even though that shocked a lot of people who were like, who just thought that, because I, I mean, I think Jungianism, the early days of the Institute, it was held back by being tethered to the language of psychoanalysis, that it was intellectualizing and thinking and analyzing and not an experience. Yeah. And so, I mean, he said, and I don't know that Hillman ever really found out a way to apply archetypal psychology as a technique. I mean, it was more of a concept, you know, that he, he saw what was wrong with things. Um, but you know, he was, everyone kind of was reacted with shock when he left the Institute and did that. But then it was kind of ahead of his time in that, like, most of the best models of psychotherapy we have that were coming, you know, trying to fight back against the cognitive revolution during the 80s and CBT and all that. They were Jungian analysts who left the Institutes because they wanted a somatic and an experiential piece, the direct experience. And yes. I mean, um, you know, Arnie Mandel left and made process therapy. Sidron Hal Stone left and made voice dialogue. I mean, a ton of those guys were all Jungian analysts running the institutes who left to do essentially, I mean, they were on the same quest as Hillman, is how do you directly experience this stuff and how do you place it in the body? And Hillman was the first analyst that I found ever in the history of the institute to say that the archetypes have a somatic component, that you yeah. are not feeling the whole image unless you find it in your body, you know, which is the thing that brought me to him because I was, I was trying to get people to, to feel an image physically, to feel an emotion physically to heal trauma at really early in my career. Yeah, well, that's really interesting. And, and you know, it's kind of like there's all these different gods that we incorporate is the way he mm -hmm. would, you know, that's the polytheistic way of looking at things. And we, we have, we have, and once he said of himself, he said, I, I, uh, I, I make my way with my Hermes opportunism, right? He loved Dionysus uh, and, and he, Aphrodite, he invoked these different, gods even with his patients you know as 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 ways to connect to those parts of ourselves i think you would i would say and um so yeah i mean it was really a fascinating new new approach that gathered i mean all these young people who were searching for something and came to zurich in search of jung and mm -hmm. Jung in the early 1970s you know hippies on the road i did some of that myself you know just hitchhiking yeah. all over the place and uh I'm and jealous this, not the same road that it once was. You no, know, <laughs> if you sell your shoes. Yeah. <laughs> unfortunately, I wish it was. I wish that, you know, younger people could experience what I did back then, but uh I wasn't one of those who went to Zurich, but but these uh a lot of the, these these young people enrolled at the Young Institute and then Hillman did these amazing nights called Spring House. At this that's what the name of the place was, right? Mm. In Zurich and and all and all these these folks gathered and they would they would uh study these esoteric texts like the Picatrix and uh, that was a medieval text and yeah. magic magic was very involved with that and and the the the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, memory theater of, of Don Camillo and mm -hmm. and bringing these things to the light again that had been definitely forgotten you know and not, mm -hmm. not thought about it. and it was they, they would all drink wine and and get toasted and you know things would happen like uh, one night Raphael who was a wild man himself and very close to Hillman for years, and he was from uh, Cuba originally. And uh, he, he, one night, he were talking about one of these about Dionysus, I think. And suddenly, uh, a drunk fell through the window. Yeah. And Raphael says, "You see, we constellated, and they created it right in front of us." Yeah, Hillman was really his like little uh, posse was very into constellating gods. That was like the language that they would always use when something manifested but i mean they they got into those things because they saw them as kind of uh, projections of the deep unconscious that by looking at these medieval texts right. you could see something where somebody who was not aware of the psychology we have now is kind of telling on themselves by projecting these things into science into pre pre-scientific sciences like alchemy or yeah. into like summoning magic into summoning angels like john d and that or mythology the, the gods that when people People don't create religion in a vacuum. You know, they we have something inside of us and, and we projected it out in our early days and that we can go back and look at that to kind of understand who we are. Yeah. Um, and I, I think 
that's not always understood. I mean, I think that sometimes people just think that, you know, Jungian therapy equals, you know, Americans, a lot of times it's like, it just equals therapy plus Jesus or therapy plus they believe in magic and the tarot. And it's like, you know, mm-hmm. they see these things as pieces of self, you know, and that's something that people who aren't coming from that background don't always get. Yeah, it's so true. And a lot of, a lot of these young people who came then in the early seventies, you know, there was Tom Kapusinskis and Robert Hinshaw and, and, um, uh, uh, Paul Kugler, lots of these guys then became analysts themselves and brought a lot of these ideas with them, of course, uh, after they left Zurich. And, and Casey, who was, I mean, there, there were a number of these folks that I interviewed and write about in the, in the, in the biography. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it was a whole new road and it was an exciting era, you know, I mean, yeah. coming out of the sixties and, and, uh, when the Senex and Puer, as, as Hillman, described in, in the, a lecture and in, in a book of the same name, you know, the Senex was the, the forces, the, sort of like the old guard, you know, among the mm-hmm. Jungians. We didn't like Hillman very much, a lot of them. They thought yeah. he was breaking away from Jung and versus the Puer, which Hillman described himself as, you yeah. know, always bringing, you know, new ideas into the light. And, and uh, uh, but you had to have both. I mean, you had to combine mm-hmm. the discipline of the Senex with the inspired vision of the Puer in order to really get somewhere in life. And that was one of the things that he talked about a lot. Well, I think he struggled to reconcile them. And you see it in his books where they're kind of very romantic and idealistic, or they're just incredibly intellectual, written for intellectuals. And then he doesn't know why they're not as successful as Thomas More's books. Yeah. And and I think, you know, the thing that is interesting to me, because I relate a lot to Hillman's, vi- like, worse angels, you know, like I want to check some of my own impulses. and But, you know, he he is kind of crazy, you know, towards the end of his life, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things where he doesn't quite integrate it. And I I think, you know, he really was looking for this way of directly experiencing archetypes. He wanted looking, his whole career was trying to find a direct access to soul and everything he wrote, you see that hunger. And I wonder, because I haven't, I'm excited for your book because I haven't really seen a lot of, you know, secondhand accounts of it, but I wonder if when the red book came out, if he saw that and he, if that was what that, if that fulfilled, scratched that itch for him, you know, that, that process of active imagination was pretty similar to the archetypal psychology. He didn't know you and read, read the red book until it was published. That's right. It, it, it does look a lot like the process that he was trying to make and, and doesn't ever really do case studies of, and doesn't ever really describe techniques for. Yeah. I mean, he was knocked out by that book and he realized this is toward the end of his life. And, and uh, he gave talks on the Red Book, uh, a couple, several venues, one on Masonu Shandasani and with the actress Helen Hunt. And, and uh, well, Lament amazing. for the Dead, after the Red Book, him discussing it, that's probably one of the best things he ever wrote. It's incredible. And, and you know, where you get into the, you know, the dead, the ancestors, mm-hmm. uh, which has always been very important to him. He had the pictures on, a, on, on his wall. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I, he said to me that that, he realized that he was he and Jung were really on the same page in a yeah. lot of ways that he had not realized until he saw that book. And he had a dream at that time. I think I write about this in volume three. He didn't talk to me about dreams too much, mm-hmm. but he had a dream. He had had a number of dreams about Jung through the years. And in one of them, Jung was saying to him about their work, it's beyond human history. Yeah. <laughs> which I thought was pretty wonderful, you know. I wonder, that. see, that's my question is because when I see Hillman's career, I just see the father wound, you know, running rampant. And that, like, I don't even think he would have gone back just to the Greeks. I mean, I think if you let him go, he would have gone back to the mother cult and be going into the cave with the Venus of Villendorf. I mean, he really was trying to go all the way to the bottom of something. Yeah. And I wonder, you know, he, he wrote Lament for the Dead, and I see that there, but I'm interested in the biography if when he sees the Red Book, he kind of forgives some of the animosity he had with Jung and finds peace. He does. You know? Absolutely, he does. And you'll read about that in volume three because it was a really important realization that he came to not too long before he died. He was 85 years old when he died in, in 2011. And and um, at, by that point, I had written, well, I never started out to write a three-volume book, right? I was going to do one volume. And I was blessed to have many, many, interviews with him in the course of that, all of which, you know, I, I'd be writing and I, and I shared with him what I was writing about these aspects of his life. So I never got beyond a certain point in his life in terms 
before he died, but um, I was able to uh, to sit with him and have him elaborate on these various themes as he read the chapters that I had put together about various periods in his life. And that was, wow, that was amazing. And and also to see him um, at, give these talks on the Red Book during that period and, and read the Red Book myself. I mean, yeah. I, I I was blown away by by it too, and by the artistry of Jung's uh, beautiful paintings in, in the in the book as well, which I had no idea he was that talented an artist. And one of the things that Hellman does, like he does, that is very that is very original kind of technique, is saying that if anima and animus are archetypes, then they're present in both genders. You know, yeah. men have an animus too. Um, right. Do you see any of that in his in the end of his life? Does that play a part in, in anything that is to come in the in your story? Yeah, well, I, I think the anima is always. I mean, he was always in pursuit of the anima, right? Yeah. But it's interesting that, and we're skipping ahead a bit here, but it is in volume two, where I write about his connection to the mythopoetic men's movement. Yeah. And that was a huge thing for him. Um, we could. If we can skip ahead to there, perhaps, and then come back to other things. But you know, it, it was a period in his in his life. He was he turned sixty. Uh, he and Pat Berry, who'd been married for twenty years, were um, getting close to splitting up. Um, Aranos, which was this amazing place in Switzerland uh, on Lake Lago Maggiore, where he'd been going and meeting these underground giants uh, for for you know also pretty much twenty years. That he was, starts donning a um, like uh, Casablanca trench coat and a fedora <laughs> during this period of his life too. Yes, <laughs> right after that divorce. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and so he he um, th th that's coming to an end for him as well. And that's when he he he's met Robert Bly, the poet, and he meets this uh, uh, storyteller who uses fairy tales of all things with men uh, named Michael Mead, and they yeah, form. I'm familiar. Yeah, we were, I think we were going to invert view him in September, and our schedules keep not aligning. Oh well, that'd be great if you could, and you could, of course, ask him about his relationship with James Hillman because they had a very powerful and not always uh, well. It was frayed toward the end, I guess, but they had hmm. a lot of amazing. Uh, God, I mean, the things that they did with 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 groups of men. I, I, I mean, I talk about it now because the the anima part. Well, it was like men have feelings that aren't just feminine feelings. You know, they have feelings that are often, you know, squelched in themselves, not allowed to come to the surface. And uh, they went through just these incredible conversations where they would use, uh, Mead would, would use a fairy tale. Well, I would read the poetry of Yeats or Rumi or whoever, right? And, and Hillman would give these intellectual talks. Uh, and they on an Akhmatov, too, he would always, um, I am blanking on the poem, but yeah, I've got a lot of those tapes. It's the recordings. Oh, oh yeah, he, me drumming and telling a myth and Helvin chiming in and yeah, yeah. Well, they had a great relationship of the three of them as teachers, and they would bounce things off each other, and they would be you know a hundred men in a room uh, there for a week in the in the redwoods, right, and in, in Minnesota or Maine or uh, California, Mendocino, and you know it was interpreted by the media a lot of this, especially as it became more of a movement, quote unquote, and. There's a lot of publicity about it in the 1990s, and it was often dismissed, you know, as, oh, it's just these guys out in the woods, you know, yeah. getting off, uh, dancing with each other and talking bad about their wives. And well, so I think it was viewed, too, as kind of a misogynist thing, you know, that women weren't allowed or something. And But a lot of it, I think they saw the kind of toxic Rambo culture of the 80s, and they were trying to save men from themselves and try and protect women from men by healing trauma. You know, so many of those stories are about how do you not take your PTSD? And the myths that Mead is drumming and telling, they're like, how do you not take your PTSD out on other people? How do you own it and hold it and heal it? You know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. A lot of these guys who came to these events were Vietnam vets. They'd been through terrible PTSD experiences. Uh, a lot of them, you know, abandoned fathers. That was a big subject. But the effort was to get men beyond those things and, and uh, explore the soul, really, the yeah. depths of themselves with each other, in a safe space where you know they didn't allow reporters uh, usually, and and uh, and the, uh, many times, I mean, there's there many stories about the, the when they would go home, the the wives would say, "Wow, what happened to you? You know, you're a whole other guy." Um, yeah. 
in all kinds of ways. So it was vitally important uh, to, I, and I interviewed lots of people about this. I mean, there should, should be a whole book on it in itself. I'm not going to do it, but somebody should, because, uh, and, 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 and for Hillman, it was a very important thing because he became really just one of the guys, you know? Yeah. And he was this egghead, you know, uh, that, that had to uh, <laughs> kind of do sometimes outrageous things in, in order to connect to these these folks who didn't really trust this erudite uh, guy talking yeah. about all these things, which he did. You know, there's, there's stories I tell in the book about about uh, uh, one time Hillman. It's one of the early events. He he he, he fashioned a, some headgear out of ferns and he walked into one a group of these men. And he said, "My name is Fern." Because he thought this way, you made up names of these things. Another time, there was a, to, just to get his goat right. Some of them, some of the men had this. One of their their people walk in uh, uh, without any clothes on and take a seat. And uh, what Hillman did was he just looked at the room and looked at the guy and he said, "Would you stand up, please? <laughs> so, <laughs> introduce yourself." <laughs> that endeared him, right? Of course, because. Yeah. He, he could do these kind of things and would because they were, they were sincere. You know, he wasn't mm -hmm. making this stuff up, although he, he was a very good actor. I mean, and he loved Shakespeare. Yeah. And, and I mean, uh, Boardwalk, Boardwalk City, man. Like, yeah, he, he, like, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, and I, I don't, I want to be respectful of your time and also get to, you know, your second book that you wanted to talk about. But I mean, just as an in betweener, um, because, a lot of times, you know, we want to talk about the, the writer's process or the artist's process on on these things. And I mean, you're an investigative journalist, but you've written about the environment. You've written about, you know, not conspiracy theories like in a typical way, but kind of as the power behind the power um, or maybe what in our own, you know, American or mythology, maybe we we're, we're blind to because it is a myth. You know, nationalism is kind of a myth, just like advertising and and pop culture and all these things. Um, and, you know, also shamanism, uh, you know, personal work. It seems like you're in all of those things sort of are in the category of mythology, you know, like, is, would you agree or is that what you're doing? I don't want to speak for you, but that's an open ended question. I mean, yeah, in a way, I guess I am, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm somebody whose career as a writer, I guess, is most everything I've done is about bringing something into the light that's been in the dark. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's, you know, I hadn't thought about it until recently, really, in this way. But, uh, you know, I explored the, the mysteries of the Kennedy assassination and mm -hmm. brought that to light in a path-breaking book. I, I wrote a book called Black Genius and the American Experience, which was about these incredible African-Americans that my son was biracial. And I kind of wrote the book, is biracial, he's still around, uh, wrote the book sort of with him in mind of what he would he should know about some of these figures, you know, in all different mm -hmm. fields. Then I, I wrote a book about uh, this mysterious interaction between whales and humans, where in, in Mexico... You may just made a movie about that one, right? Uh, <laughs> James Cameron. <yeah. laughs> exactly. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's these great whales in, in uh, this lagoon in Baja, Mexico, halfway down the peninsula, that mysteriously began coming up to small boats about 30, 40 years ago. And I had this experience. I went down there to write about this salt works that Mitsubishi was planning to build with the Mexican government to wipe out this habitat, basically, where the, the mother whales brought their, their young every year after a 5,000-mile migration. And uh, these whales would come up to you and introduce their young, and you're petting whales in the wild. Mm -hmm. And, and, and they like to have their gums rubbed. And so I wrote a book about this and, and, uh, and followed their migration all the way to, to Russia. Um, so anyway, various things like that, that uh, I have explored and uh, been blessed to have an opportunity to, to look into. And mm -hmm. that includes this book that I wrote a few years ago. Um, again, it's, without James Hillman, I never would have written it in a sense. I can mm -hmm. tell you why, but called My Mysterious Son, A Life-Changing Passage Between Schizophrenia and Shamanism. And mm -hmm. do you mind if we, I, uh, or we you know, introduce schizophrenia for people who may not be aware of the condition or, or kind of the um, different parts of it? Yeah, well, it's it's a uh, very traumatic, um, sudden onset 
illness that happens to thousands of young people around the age of 17, usually 18. The right prodromal age. period is a little bit earlier, usually in men than women, but it usually is, you know, kind of late teens for guys and yeah. maybe early 20s for women. Um, you know, a couple of things can speed it up or slow down the uh, presentation of it. But a big one that makes the symptoms be fueled a lot is trauma. You know, the genes, you can have 80% of the, and this is kind of me opining, this is maybe a controversial take, but, you know, our genes like inform how we express the trauma, but the trauma is the fuel under the genes. And dopamine disorders like uh, schizophrenia, OCD, um, uh, manic depressive and bipolar, like they tend to run in families. You know, you'll see that. But it is the trauma that sets it off. And a lot of times by treating the trauma, you can bring the symptom down and reduce the need for the medications, which have some pretty severe side effects some of the time, quite a bit. Um, and I think when, when was uh, Franklin diagnosed? When was he first going on medication? 17. 17. Or no, what like year, uh, calendar year? Well, 1990s, 1996. Uh, okay. Yeah. So in the, and there have been like some pretty good advancements since then. Um, one of the things that we can do now, um, which not everyone knows about it, I'm mentioning it in case anyone with schizophrenia or someone who knows someone with schizophrenia is listening is, you know, a lot of the antipsychotics have a side effect where they may have a metabolic syndrome where people gain a ton of weight. They, yeah. they don't know when they're full and it, and it changes your personality to get, gain 200 pounds. It changes a lot of things. Um, yeah, well, good. now we know that you can prescribe a, a low dose of an anticonvulsant like Topamax. And it counteracts that metabolic syndrome. So if the antipsychotics working for you, you know, you, you can go to the psychiatrist. Not all the psychiatrists know that. And there's not a ton of research done about schizophrenia because the people who have it generally are not very wealthy. Um, and there's not very many of them. So it's a tiny, it's a rare disorder anyway. And that's what, part of why it's so cool is that, um, you know, we will research to how to make the 30th statin, even though they all work the same. Because every old white guy watching the news is going to get high cholesterol, and we can pretend that this one, so we dump all this money into it. Whereas things that are really needed, like antibiotics and and, and, and antipsychotics, we don't have enough. We don't have good ones, and yeah. we're not spending any money researching them. You know, they do in some countries with more of a socialized research mentality. Um, so that's that's sad. I mean, I think that's wrong um, because that's what we need. We don't need you know. Quazilla statin, you know. Um, and then also one of the things that is really helpful with the med management now, it's more gentle on the body and it also is just so much easier um, to help regulate somebody with a thought disorder is there's an injectable medication. So you can get a time release one month to three month, you know, dose of the medication. So if you miss a dose or you're having a lot of stress and the symptoms flare up, you know, you can you can really stay a lot more stable, you know. So there have been some progress since the '90s, but it, it still is it's a hard thing to manage and, and something we don't spend enough time trying to treat. Yeah, and, and you know, of course, it's marked at the beginning certainly by by paranoia and uh, and so-called delusional thinking, uh, mm -hmm. and and that lasted, uh, you know, for a long time with my son, and uh, and and it was a very tough period, which I describe mm -hmm. in, in the book. Um, but eventually it led me to seek some kind of, not necessarily going off medication entirely, but an adjunct to the mm -hmm. antipsychotic regimen because, God, it, the side effects were just so severe. And, and he had put on, just like you described, Franklin had put on 100 pounds. And yeah. he was this handsome kid who just suddenly, you know, ballooned up. And it was, uh, it was really, really tough for a long time. But um, ended up actually through, um, there was a man named Melodoma Somme who uh, was a, was a shaman from West Africa at Burkina Faso, and he was part of this men's movement that James Hillman uh, founded. And um, they got to know each other. And when um, I was looking for an alternative, something, um, my my wife remember I'd interviewed Melodoma, but just on the phone, I'd never met him. He had been uh, at this landmark gathering of uh, at Buffalo Gap, West Virginia, 50 black men and 50 white men coming together in a room for a week to really get down and talk about uh, their lives and their soul experiences. But anyway, so I contacted Melodoma and went to him for a divination where he spoke about my ancestors and how the ancestors on my side really didn't understand my son. They didn't know who he was. Of course, they were white. And then the ancestors on uh, Franklin's mother's side were African-American. 
So I had, I went through a series of rituals. Uh, it's a very long story, and I'm not going to be able to tell it all here, but it made a huge difference, especially when uh, we ended up going as a family several years after I first met Maladoma uh, to West Africa, to his mm-hmm. village, uh, and spent a, a month there with a healer mm-hmm. that he had. Um, and he was he prescribed this. <laughs> we, we, said we had these big herbal pots that each of us, Franklin's mother and myself, and and, uh, and Franklin would would bathe with every day, um, drink water from, and it was full of these herbs that had been specifically prescribed for us. And we also went through a series of rituals over there, doing this as a family with a, with a bunch of other people who had come along too. They had their own issues that they were they were seeking help for. And I tell you, it changed a lot of things. I mean, mm. we we Franklin went way down on his medication after that um, and is still uh, some years later now not in as much as he was and he's he's really so much better than he's been since he had his breakdown at the age of 17. He's living with his mom and uh, doing a lot of great art. We talk mm-hmm. all the time um, or way past the, the the very traumatic things that we continued to go through as he was growing up. And he's in his 40s now and uh, I couldn't be couldn't be happier about how he's doing. And a lot of that I attribute to, uh, uh, first of all, to James Hillman and then to what Maladoma did for us, who passed away, unfortunately, a couple of years ago. Well, I think one of the things that's kind of cruel, um, especially if you're seeing a, a somebody who's very rigidly cognitive therapist or people who are more intellectual, uh, not intellectual, uh, but people who are very into the ego is all that we are, is they don't understand the disease and they start to treat it like it's a disease and pathologize it. And they debate you that this isn't real. This isn't real. And I mean, these are experiences that, yeah, we didn't pick the time. Yeah. They're kind of inconvenient. Yeah. It's psychosis, but they're an opportunity to see our emotional self and our wounds and things that we need to heal. And so a ton of times, you know, somebody who's been on, uh, antipsychotics for a long time and it needs to stay on antipsychotics to to treat the um you know just have a, a normal pace of life with schizophrenia when they come to therapy you know the 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 psychotic episode's bad i'm afraid of it and all this stuff i did all these things i'm embarrassed about why did i do that but then when you say okay no but these this is symbols let's treat this more like a dream you know what is that telling you and then all of a sudden it becomes part of me that it's like oh yeah you know i do need to indulge this part of myself and i do need to be afraid of this thing or i this is what i'm longing to create you know there and and then it becomes less of a scary thing um Mm -hmm. but unfortunately so few uh medical professionals do that and and it is because they don't do it and they debate you and say oh this is irrational or this is a you know there's not a dragon in your basement whatever instead of just sitting with the image and the emotion even if you can't sit with the image or you don't know what it means you must feel so scared that this stuff's going on you know, yeah. let's sit with we'll sit with that. Then when when you lean into that kind of cognitive therapy with with a, a, a psychosis, what happens is the person isn't going to listen to anything. They go off their medication yeah. and they're not going to listen to anything that you have to say because they know that you're you know not respecting this part of them. And that's why the outcomes so much of the time are so poor for any kind of psychotic disorder. Yeah, well, you, you know, and I, I wrote about it in that book about James Hillman and what he told me one day. Uh, he was never my therapist, but he, he he tuned in to what was going on with myself and my son back in 2004, I think. And and he said, you know, his advice was, hey, you know, because I kept trying, I'd get embarrassed, you know, I had things he would say. And and uh, he said, you know, just quit trying to correct him, you know, just go treat him like a normal person. Nobody treats him normally. Of course, he doesn't want to go to therapies and wants to go on medication because he's not he's treated like a crazy person all the time. Yeah. So just, you know, tell him about your life. and. And once I tell you, once I started doing that, it changed our relationship uh, completely. So I will always be grateful to James Hillman for that. Just that one day of, of advice. And, I, you know, I want to say about this. I mean, what is schizophrenia really? I mean, nobody really knows. Um, and it, one thing about that I learned from my son is that he's in tune with uh, other worlds. Yeah, it is. a. Uh... It, it is such a relationship to the unconscious, such a wide gate that yeah. you lose the ability to tell the difference between what's happening right now in the room with me, what I can imagine or what my emotions are symbolizing 
and all this old genetic imagery. You can't tell yep. the difference. You're just kind of in this collage of stuff. And then people are telling you that it's bad, you know, uh, yep. and you're not, you're going to reject and have a negative reaction to that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, all of a sudden he would, he would be drawing these geometric patterns and he would be writing in hieroglyphic symbols. And where's that coming from? It, yep. it is something very ancient. But, but they always have such a powerful intuition that is healing yeah. them if you get them in touch with it, you know? Exactly. And I think that that, thank God, that that, that actually was able to happen. I, I wouldn't have come to it myself, I don't think. But, you know, because in, Af in African cultures, other indigenous cultures, the, the shaman is often considered, you know, or the schizophrenic, so-called, is actually it's considered a shaman in many, many ways. Yeah. Because, you know, this, he can tune in, or he or she. They can tune into uh, things about people and situations that uh, are, are really connected to ancestral forces, beings perhaps that really exist, but that most of us don't acknowledge or see, but they do. And it, it forces a recognition in that way that, I mean, I'm so grateful for it. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's something that I would never, um, as a rational investigative journalist, have, have come to. Well, and I think that like the difference in more of a shamanic healing instead of, you know, the way that we conceive of medicine here and it's take a pill germ theory. If this is wrong, then this is the thing that you do it. You know, the, the way that shamanic healing works is that somebody who is out of control of their experience, you come in and you don't treat, you don't control, you just hold the experience for them. Yeah. And, and then they see you holding their experience and then they learn to hold their own experience. And that's and that's empowering. That's what you need. And I think the people who I've met that have been damaged by being pulled out of the psychosis, it was that they were actually enjoying this thing. And it's scary to the people around them. But something has kind of opened up, you know, and they're in this world and they're trying to figure out the experience. And all of a sudden you're pulled out of that, you know, with an antipsychotic, which, you know, has some benefits, you know, too much psychosis. Jung said that the ego becomes uh uh, perforated that it can no longer kind of keep the unconscious at bay if it's been submerged too much you know now we have some evidence that there is damage to the prefrontal cortex uh, too many psychotic breaks you do start to lose overall functioning which is why it's important to recognize the prodromal period and, and get on the medication early but you know the people who really were trying to heal themselves basically and then the medication is pulling them out of that have had damage because they're not done you know and yeah. they feel like something's taken from them and they have this, um, you know, need to go back and confront it and integrate it. Um, and yes. one of the things that's interesting with schizophrenia, too, I mean, I'm not advocating for this, but, you know, people will kind of heal themselves and age out of it. You know, there's a lot of risk to that. You're, you're not advocating for that. But if you have a lot of wealth and money or you're kind of enabled, you know, John Nash is a, is a case for that. He, his beautiful mind's not really right. He never really took the medication. He just kind of went around. Um, you know, I, the, his Ivy League school until he slowly was like, oh, OK, I'm all right. And towards the end of his life, he did, he said that psychosis was kind of a, a retreat and an escape from these overwhelming forces of logic that he was trying to live in. And he felt more integrated. Yeah, you know? but that took 10 years. You know, <laughs> that was, that's you know, a great story. It's very true. And, yeah. and I think that's happened with, with my son, too. I mean, he's in his 40s now, you know, so he's he is. And James Hubman, too, told me that this often happens, that. That people age, age out, you know, not completely, but but I think that uh, I've certainly seen that, and and at the same time, Franklin's still very intuitive, you know, and 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 I mean, I've I was amazed in the past of how he could he could read my mind, you know, sometimes. Yes, yeah. and they and, understand a lot of times like really heightened intuition. They're not even really listening to what you're saying because they already know what you're thinking better than you do. You know, exactly. somebody says, "I want this thing," but they know what you need. And yeah. then they end up in therapy and, you know, <laughs> they end up doing therapy, you know, <laughs> right, right. They end up making this podcast. But yeah. <laughs> well, it's fascinating. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's also a very tough road. I, I will certainly yeah. say. And I wrote the book. The left hand path is what, you know, Joseph Campbell called that journey. Yeah. 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 And I, I wrote the book because I wanted people to know, well, who could relate to the, the painful experience, but also, could realize there are other ways of approaching this and other ways to look at it and also even to find, you know, not necessarily a cure, but something that would be very 
helpful and useful in the kinds of ways that, that you're talking about as well. So yeah. I hope that that's the case. And and um, yeah, the book uh, did a, two editions came out. The paperback, most recent one, tells the the whole story of, of uh, our journey to Burkina Faso and and uh, as well as the earlier part. So I hope people will find it. I was always kind of struck when I was uh, doing my like early work in the similarity between uh, people with schizophrenia and people with dementia, different kinds of dementia, because there there is this they're not listening to what you say as much as how you what you feel. Uh, and they don't remember what you say a lot of the time. They remember how you made them feel, you know, yeah. so when it's like put your jacket on, it's cold. You know, the dementia person just sees this anger and they don't like it. Um, you know, but a patient with dementia, when you're just like, oh, it's OK, I'm putting my jacket on. Do you see that? You know, and then all of a sudden you're just friends and what they're saying doesn't make any sense, but they're looking and smiling and you're walking and, you know, mm-hmm. they, you know, you can tell that they're going through this thing. And and we just treat both of those disorders wrong. You know, you go to like the Netherlands in different countries and, you know, the uh, the places where people with dementia live is it's like, you know, there's a shopping, there's the, the fake supermarket with the plastic food and you get the card and you go through and you get it. None of it's real, you know. And yeah. then, you know, you go to the bed at night and they kind of have a routine. And here it's just like you're put into a cinder block hellhole with fluorescent lighting and then you're given drugs because you're not sleeping at the right time and you're not doing this. And then you're not bathing. So people bathe you. And and then this the experience is, is traumatic, you know, for somebody who cannot advocate for themselves. Um, but when you let them kind of have a more empowered and naturalistic thing, you know, the outcomes are so much better and there's so much less trauma. And I think we do both of those. Um, disorders just uh, a huge disservice in the way that we treat them uh, in mass here. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And uh, and it's it's tragic, really, for lots of families that that's that's all there is. I mean, in the beginning, I I didn't know that there was anything beyond you know just more and more medication of different mm-hmm. kinds. I had no idea. I mean, that's what they're telling you. And oh, this will help with this, and this will help with the you know the depression, and this one will take care of the delusions and the paranoia. And, and then it just kind of becomes a deadening thing. I mean, because the yep. person himself is trying to break through to something, you know, and to to live a life that is connected. And yet they're reduced to that often. And it's, uh, I mean, we went there, you know, and it, it's it's uh, it's very tough. But um, there's, I'm just grateful that there's a reward on the other side, which is, you know, I, I talk, my son calls me all the time. We talk about what he's doing. He's calling He's always, uh, you know, he's taking classes in welding and he's, he's, uh, you know, learning how to do various things with us. He loves to work with his hands. It's completely different than me. I mean, I work with my hands too, but I just type. <laughs> so, uh, but he's, he's involved in, he has a shop out back where he builds all these unusual sculptures. And so I don't always understand what it's about, but I just so appreciate that that's who he's, he's become. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's beautiful. Thank you for thank you for sharing. Um, I mean, I wish that we had um, you know infinite time because you've written about so many topics. But it seems like env- the v- environment is a pretty big one. Um, you write a lot about ecology. Um, I was curious have you have you ever read any of the stuff like Edge of the Sacred that David Tacey writes about depth psychology and ecology? It, it, y'all seem similar in that. I have not read David Tacey on that, but I've read other you know like eco psychology is a came to the fore when Hillman was alive and he became mm-hmm. very involved in it himself and wrote a, a book or at least an introduction with Theodore Rozak, who was the the, mm-hmm. the scholar who founded that. So, um, yeah, he had his own, uh, you know, very vital interest in, in ecology and, and in, he was a gardener, you know, he was out there planting trees and doing stuff like that all the time. And, and, uh, and I wrote uh, a lot for many, many years about the environment and on every single issue and, did uh, two books on well, a book and then an updated version about climate change and the big moguls who are, you know, knew everything about it 30 years ago and wouldn't do anything, just yeah. uh, covered it up. So I, I, again, it's kind of exposing what's been hidden. This is uh, mm-hmm. really what my one of my metier is. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's a different kind of uh, applied depth psychology. You know, going in and seeing things other people can't see and bringing it out. You know. Yeah, and then. I think what Hillman emphasized too was to take it personally in the sense of he, he gave this amazing talk in, in Italy in 1981 on the anima mundi, the soul of the world. And he felt that one of the big problems with conventional therapy is that it's all the, all the emphasis is on you yourself and your problems and you know, what your mother did to you or your father and, 
and and there's so much wrong in the world that we can get involved in and and apply you know principles psychological principles to and let's go there you know let's let's uh let's turn our gaze that direction uh rather than rather than just you know taking the like take the, the inner into the outer you know yeah and, and and make make that the soul the soul's code or the soul's work um so yeah and i've tried to do that very involved in several personal you know crusades to save a fish the atlantic striped bass i wrote a book about that and uh later in mexico uh, the gray whales and uh, this coral reef that was dying and once you protected it fish came back it's yeah. not that big a you know jump <laughs> the striped bass came back they were almost extinct suddenly they were the greatest it was the greatest uh, conservation success story in the world so but it, it, it isn't even that we don't plan for it or understand it it's that we are planning for the problem that we're causing i mean i was reading that you know mitsubishi is designing these huge deep freezers to keep stuff perfectly uh, intact for um basically you know more than 50 years so that they can buy these enormous cattle sized cuts of salmon so that when i mean it's not salmon tuna so that when the tuna are extinct, you can still auction off million dollar, you know, blocks of sushi wow. to these restaurants. And it's like, I mean, they're preparing for a fishery to be devastated and an animal to be extinct. Yeah. That it's you cool. could just not kill, you know, <laughs> basically. Yeah. Isn't that the ultimate commoditization? I mean, projecting like that. Jeez, I, I went to the, some years back, I was in Japan for a, a whaling conference, actually. And went to the Skiji fish market where they bring all these, I mean, it was one of the most horrible experiences. You know, all these amazing, beautiful tuna that have been were, were in there frozen, you know, deeming deep frozen. And, ah, oh, I tell you, and, and, and there aren't that many left in the water. We were just, uh, it's appalling what we're doing to our our natural environment and the beautiful creatures that inhabit it. And it, it pains me. And I, I, I think more people got to get involved. Yeah. Well, um, I I kind of wish Hillman had lived long enough to see something like brain spotting, and also to live long enough to watch James Cameron's Avatar movies. <laughs> like it seems like that you know that that kind of uh, you know paganistic nature worship was something that he would really like the way that this guy could mainstream it in a way that he he couldn't. And also that brain, brain spotting is just so much of the direct experience you see Hillman longing for, but kind of failing. And getting the techniques to do, you know, archetypal psychology is conceived, but never defined, you know, and and not even really practiced, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's the, there like you're talking about applications of the ideas that that you're working on, and I'm sure others are too. And I think that's fantastic because that's the future, right? You take the take the concept yeah. and that was that was created that harkens back in time to the Renaissance and the Greeks, and and then you move it forward into a way that. Maybe people in our age can, uh, can well, you know, and I think, you know, insurance comes in in the 80s and academia gets corporatized and healthcare gets corporatized and, and they just say, we're not going to mess around with trying to feel anything. We're basically just going to give some people ego management strategies and psycho uh, education and call it CBT. And if that doesn't work, give them a pill. And that, that's what we do. And now the pendulum is swinging the other way where these companies are like, wait a minute, maybe paying for band aids for an entire lifetime is not as good of a strategy as just going out and healing the wound. And now we're more interested in trauma and somatic psychology and the body brain, you know, the, yeah. the, you know, the, the beneath language part of us is what is causing trauma. So just talking about it and analyzing it is maybe fun or connects you to your therapist or helps you relationally, but it doesn't help you get the stuff out of the body and regulate the stuff. And cognitive therapy is fine. You know, it's like sailing a boat, but the best person who the best sales person cannot, um, or not salesperson, the best sailor cannot sail a sailboat through a hurricane. Okay, you got to clear the water first before you can build those skills. Yeah, and it, it's frustrating to me because I mean I'm I'm not kidding. It's the same authors. It is the same doctors on these research papers that for years are, are laughing at Jung and saying none of this is evidence based and you know cognitive behavioral therapy is the gold standard. Just which they say that just because it's easy to research it because you can turn every part of it into a number because there's no room for intuition. And there's no trust for the clinician and there's no room for the patient's experience um, because you can turn everything into a number. They research a lot and then they're like, oh, wow, the only thing we research looks like it researches pretty well. Um, but they're writing these papers about Jung and the unconscious is not real and repressed memory doesn't exist. And this idea of somatic 
psychotherapy and mindfulness based whatever is not as effective as medication and that there is no unconscious. And then now they're publishing this stuff to get on them this new academic trend. And they're all like, oh, there's three kinds of memory, primary, secondary, and tertiary. And secondary and tertiary are beneath the cognitive, or, you know, oh, well, implicit memory is inside. It's like, oh, you mean the, yeah, you, you, like, you mean the fucking unconscious. Like, yeah. <laughs> means, yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. No, it's, that, that's fantastic. <laughs> that is great to hear because making the unconscious. One day I'm going to drink enough red wine to write them an email, but uh, I try and stay off the radar of the people who control the boards and the profession. So, um. Well, that's good. I'm glad you can, because otherwise, you know, I mean, let's face it, who's making money off a lot of these therapies is uh, is the pharmaceutical industry that, uh, you know, is yeah. making billions of dollars uh, and and, uh, and they don't give a damn. I mean, well, maybe they some of them do, but I don't want to totally judge the industry, but but in general, it's it's uh, it's it's not right. That's the entire emphasis, and and we need to. I, I think what's happening. We're beginning to explore making the unconscious conscious. You know, in new ways, and uh, and that's going to help a lot of a lot of people get to what's what what they need. There's a lot of um, one of the things that's like sad to me is there's it happens like in the kind of the the the. Uh, not quite new age, but a lot of the men's movements and kind of like depth psychology movements in the eighties and then in the nineties uh, about technology. Um, mm -hmm. But you go back and you listen to these recordings of people and stuff and they're all like, Oh, the ideas of depth psychology are being permeating culture and it's going to take over politics and there'll be a new political reality. And we're going to bring them back and you're listening to it in 2020. <laughs> just like, uh, I'm so sorry. I'm glad you're dead. Like, <laughs> 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 And then you've got, uh, you know, with uh, technology, there was all this talk about like, well, you know, the Internet um, is going to be this big force that's going to bring the truth to everybody because the government controls the news. But when the Internet, you can just log on and get the truth directly, then you people will use the truth to make better political decisions and politics will be fixed. And it's like, no, people don't want to change their behavior. We are machines built to not to insulate ourselves from change. And so yeah. what the internet did was it let me log on and look up 500 data points to support anything that I wanted to believe. That's right. You don't know what to believe. Climate change is like, you know, this is... Yeah. <laughs> Wherever you want to go, you don't know what to believe anymore. <laughs> but so you, you, you go for things that reinforce your own uh, prejudices in the first place. That's not yeah. really learning, you know. So uh, anyway, it's a pleasure talking to you about all this and, and uh, finding out more about what's what's going on today with, with because... I haven't I haven't been able to keep up with all that, and and uh, sounds good to me what you're doing. Well, what's sad to me is that the people who know the trauma now are in the forefront of that. They don't have you know, they don't know Jung, and the people who know Jung don't know this. So it's like I sound crazy to everybody, which is you know probably my mission in life. You know, when you do color based therapy and eye movement therapy and whatever, it's like I'm just kind of leaning into everyone's going to think I'm a crank unless they come in and actually try it. <laughs> but uh, you know, it, it's one needs the other. You know, we have this ability to treat trauma now, but we don't. We have such a poor ability to conceive it. And, yeah. you know, there's so many people that are excellent practitioners that do brain spawning and somatic therapy. And they're like, I do a video or I do a podcast. And they're like, or the worksheets we have for free on the side. And like, people are like, well, yeah, but how did you get this? What did this come from? Who trained you in this? And it's just like, this is 100 years old. You know, this is. You know, you you need the Gestalt therapy. You need Jung, you know, to be able to conceive of this stuff because you're now messing around with implicit memory. And you have no language for it. You don't know what it is. Yeah, you know, you're calling it a trigger and trauma response, or a you know trauma bond, or a, a somatic whatever. And those are just so hollow. You know, it, it's such a poor description of the thing. And and the people that are like, well, how did you? So many people are like, what is this? Where what are you doing? And it's like, it's not mine. Like. I just know how to read, you know, and I'm curious. And I kept reading CBT and being like, I, "This sucks! Like, I don't get it." You know <laughs> why? Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, I don't. I don't know. Um, yeah. So, if people want to buy the book, um, is there a place that they could buy it that would uh, give you uh, more of a cut? Is there, you know, just Amazon or, or uh, you know, any of the places? And we'll definitely include links to everything that is you would like us to link to in the show notes too. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Uh, well, I guess Amazon is the place everybody goes, including me, these days for yeah. for uh, for shopping. And uh, 
so yeah, it's available on Amazon. All my books are. Um, Skyhorse has been my publisher for the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years now. Um, and they're really good and you can order the book from them. Hopefully, you know, you can find it through your local bookstore or certainly order it through, uh, through a local bookstore. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, so it's the life and ideas of James Hillman. Uh, there's volume one, two, and three coming up. So, um, and then my mysterious son, which we've talked about today is, is available. I would, I would urge people to get the paperback rather than the hardcover because of the, it brings the story up to date if this subject is of interest to them. Do you release your books through Audible? Yeah, they are with, the, the publisher does that. Yes, they do. Yep. Yeah, that's good. So much of the books that I'd love patients to read, the ones that they end up reading are always the ones that are available on Audible because everybody is so busy and people, you know, uh, yeah. under 30, that's just how they get their, their literature. Yeah, you listen in the car, you know, whatever. Yeah. So. Well, they're working all the time. It's I don't yeah. think it's not liking reading. It's just the material reality is that you yeah. don't have the time to crack the book. Exactly. Um, yeah. Is there anything that we don't get to that you feel like is important? Um, you know, I really uh, thank you so much for sitting down with us. I'm, it's wonderful to meet you. And um, if there's ever anything I can do, reach out. Um, and just I really appreciate it. But is there anywhere that this doesn't go that you think is important or um, any way you want to? Gosh, I don't know. I mean, uh, I think we've had a really interesting, wide ranging discussion with a lot of things that uh, I've been through and are of interest to me. And and uh, psychology is certainly one of them, depth psychology and, and uh, you know, the diseases that strike people. And so, um, so yeah, it's, it's great. I really, really appreciate it. And uh, maybe we'll do it again at some point. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'd love to have you on if you want to come on with another topic. You know, you've got a body of work where we could have a whole other conversation um, another time. But um, for now, uh, please check out volume two and volume one if you haven't read it of you know, the James Hillman, the what, Life and Times? What's, what's Life and Ideas of James Hillman. Life and Ideas. And uh, th there are a lot of other books, too. I mean, on Amazon, it's pretty easy to sort by author. Um, scroll through and look at it. Um, there's a lot of heart in, in all of Dick's books. And they can go to my website. I have a website, dickrussell.org, to assist to mm -hmm. all. And that is a, has my biography and all that kind of stuff on it. So I don't keep it up as much as I should. But anyway, it's there. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll link to your website and we'll link to your uh, Amazon store. Um, and then, uh, I thank you so much. Uh, it was a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks to you, Joel. Thanks a lot for having me. We move like Roman soldiers into the wilds of the psyche to fix under a canceling star, Hermes and Aphrodite, sipping on a sunlit tree.